So welcome to everybody. It's 3.20. I think we we go on with the second panel after this first very rich panel. Thank you again for all three speakers. And then we'd I would like to introduce now Michaela Oberhofer. She is the curator for Africa and Oceania and, uh, the, and the head of the collection services um, at the Museum Rietberg in Zurich. And uh, in her last exhibition, Fiction Congo, she dealt with a large archive of Hans Himmelheber of objects, photographs and texts and questioned the decolonizing of this huge archive. But today she will speak about the new Swiss Benin initiative. Thank you very much for inviting me to this panel and for giving me the opportunity to speak about our new Benin initiative uh, in Switzerland. <clears throat> After seven years of construction, the Humboldt Forum was, was finally opened in December in Berlin Mitte, a week before the Nigerian ambassador in Berlin, Yusuf Tugar, had demanded from Angela Merkel in an open letter as he had done a year earlier to return the Benin bronzes to Nigeria. Here are some media reactions. Such requests for the restitution of artworks from the Kingdom of Benin are not new. As early as 1968, the head of the Department of Antiquities, Ekpo Eyo, made an appeal via ICOM to the museums of the Global North to donate some pieces for the planned National Museum in Benin City. Following the Macron report by Felvin Sa and Benedict Savoy, the discussion around restitution has gained new momentum in the last three years. The example of the Benin Kingdom in Nigeria plays a central role in the restitution debate. Since the 15th century, Benin had close economic and cultural ties with Europe. In the course of the colonial conquest, the British made the Benin Kingdom a British protectorate, thus reducing the sovereignty of the King Ober Oban Ramben. To enforce British rule, Vice Consul James Phillips undertook an expedition to Benin in 1897. Phillips ignored the advice that the King would not receive him during the imperial ceremonies taking place at that time. Followers of the Ober then prevented his advance by force and killed seven members of the British delegation. In retaliation, the British colonial power then sent an army of 3,000 soldiers and carriers to Benin City. In this so-called punitive expedition, the palace in Benin City was burned down, the king was arrested and exiled. In the course of the conquest of Benin City, estimated 3,000 to 5,000 objects were confiscated as so-called spoils of war and sold through the art trade to finance the British colonial expansion. Thus began the scramble for art from the Kingdom of Benin and the objects became a contested commodity on the art market. The British Museum, for example, acquired 900 Benin objects, Berlin 600. Virtually all public and private collections with African holdings contain pieces of looted art, but the exact number and the pattern of distribution remain unclear. This is why the Digital Benin project initiated by the Hamburger Museum Mark was launched last year. For the first time, all Benin holdings are to be globally recorded and brought together in a database. But what is the situation in Switzerland? The first pieces also arrived in Swiss museums shortly after the punitive expedition. Even though Switzerland never had any colonies, Switzerland was entangled in the colonization and exploitation of the African continent. Aware of this colonial burden, <clears throat> eight Swiss museums listed here joined forces last year and launched a national initiative to deal with their collections from the Kingdom of Benin. Although each of the museums owns only a small number of objects from Benin, listed here in brackets, a total of almost 100 objects, objects come together. Instead of each museum acting individually, individually we have joined forces to approach research and dialogue with Nigeria collectively. A month ago, we received funding from the Federal Office of Culture for a research project 
to investigate the provenances of Benin collections in public museums in Switzerland next year. A central element of our joint project is the collaboration with Nigerian historians and museum experts. Thus, we want to take into account the African perspective on history making and knowledge production. Before I discuss the goals of the Swiss Benin initiative, I would like to use the example of a few objects biographies to work out what is common or special about Benin collections in Switzerland. In comparison with former colonial powers, the global art trade and private collectors play a greater role in Switzerland. Let's move on to the first example. There are a total of 97 objects from Benin and Swiss collections. So far, there is evidence in about 20 cases that the art was looted during the punitive expedition. An example is the carved, this carved ivory tusk, which was placed on top of brass memorial heads, serving as ancestral shrines in memory of a deceased king. The task, uh, the task comes from the Museum der Kultur in Basel and, together with eight other pieces, was one of the first objects to arrive in Switzerland just one year after the punitive expedition. As a sign of its violent appropriation, the surface, surface still bears traces of burning, most likely from the fire in the palace. Here you can read a quotation of the museum director at the time, Fritz Sarrazin. His words correspondence corresponds to the colonial reception of Benin in Europe at that time. In the 19th century, colonial expansion ex and economic exploitation by the British were accompanied by prejudice against Benin as being barbaric and uncivilized. In the media, Benin city was described as a city of human sacrifice, as a Golgotha and a city of blood. This negative stereotyping served to justify the violence against Benin. As if in passing, Sarasin speaks of the spoils of war that were, were thrown on the market. The museum world, including Sarasin, was surprised at the technical and aesthetic quality of the pieces, something which one would not have credited Africans with, in keeping with the evolutionist thinking of the time. However, at the same instant, an aestheticization of the objects began to unfold. Museum experts such as Felix von Luschern in Berlin or Justin Brinkmann in Hamburg praised the objects as works of art. Their realistic design in particular corresponded with the European concept of art at the time. Avant-garde artists like Max Pechstein and others were also inspired by artifacts from Benin. The pieces were considered as antiquities. The origin of the objects was projected into the distant past, detached from the kingdom and its people at the time. Johannes Fabian has called this a denial of contemporaneity, a common excuse to legitimize colonial collecting practices. Derived from this, as Sarasin also writes, was the obligation to salvage the testimonies of this ancient culture from supposed disappearance, a typical argument of the collecting style in salvage anthropology. Let's move on to the next example. While British and German museums acquired most of their Benin objects immediately after the punitive expedition, this was far less the case in Switzerland. Around 60% of the Benin holdings arrived in Swiss museums only after the colonial period via various stages of the art market. But these post-colonial acquisitions and their provenance could still date back to the punitive expedition as the second example demonstrates. Such hip masks were worn by the Ober or a dignitary as a sign of high status. The material bronze was imported uh, from Europe and reminds us of the centuries old trade relations between Benin and the global North. Our museum acquired the piece through the, art ma, through the art trade in 2011. As is typical for many itineraries of Benin artifacts in Switzerland, the hip mask passed through the hands of various collectors and dealers. In this case, the hip mask traveled from Benin to Great Britain via Germany 
then to America and Canada before ending up in our museum. This is a good example of the significance of the global art trade with regard to Swiss museums. The acquisition documents reveal that it was clear from the start that the piece had been plundered during the punitive expedition. While today this colonial origin is considered problematic, 10 years ago, its provenance was seen as sign of quality regarding age and authenticity. The hip mask with its history was presented in 2018 in the exhibition, The Question of Provenance, curated by our provenance historian Esther Teaser. Prior research had revealed that the white number on the back of the objects traces back to Webster. William Webster was the main dealer of artifacts from the punitive expedition on behalf of the British government. In addition to our hip mask, a further 11 objects held in Basel and Geneva can be traced back to Webster. It remains to be seen in the course of the research project whether there are more to be added to the list. However, we, very often we face large gaps as far as our knowledge of provenances is concerned, as the next case shows. For about 45% of the Benin holdings in Swiss museums, it is still unclear whether they stand in some connection to the punitive expedition or not. This also applies to large parts of the former collection of Han Korai. In the 1920s, the Zürich gallery owner and progressive teacher was considered Switzerland's most important collector of African art. Due to financial problems, Han Korai had to sell his first Africa collection, collection through the Swiss Volksbank in 1931. His collection also included 30 objects from Benin, which are today distributed among three muse museums. Our museums, the museum holds seven, St. Gallen eight, and the Ethnological Museum of the University of Zürich 15. We know that Corey never traveled to Africa, but acquired his collection through the art trade. But there are still large gaps in our knowledge about many Corey pieces. Only three of them have been traced to art dealers such as Umlauf, Speyer, or Paul Guillaume so far. But how these men obtained the objects from the African colonies remain unclear. How such missing information can be reconstructed is, is exemplified by this equestrian figure from the Ethnological Museum of the University of Zürich. The head, however, is a replica. Han Kore only possessed the torso in his collection, as can be seen from the 1931 exhibition of his pieces in Munich, as well as from the Volksbank sales catalog here on the left. The missing head belongs to the British Museum and was acquired in 1897 by a British military officer. Even though it is not known how the rider figure was damaged and severed and how the lower, lower part came into Corey's possession, the fact that the two parts belong together suggests that the torso in the, university, in the University Museum in Zurich can also be traced back to the punitive expedition. As a final example, I would like to introduce a further category of objects which are linked to African agency in the art production and in global art market. A good third of the Benin holdings in Swiss museums have no, no direct links to the colonial conquest of Benin city. These include artifacts that were clearly made later, such as seven objects purchased by the African curator Jean Gabu in Benin city for the museum in Neuchâtel in 1963 on the left. The artifacts are antique in style but modern in make and are still produced in similar form today in Nigeria but also for example in Cameroon for the western art market. Another example from our collection is uh, this ivory pendant on the right which also old and certainly made in the 19th century arrived in post-colonial times through African hands in Europe. The pendant was acquired by Elizabeth Sink in 1965 at a promotion in the Globus department stores in Zurich. The dealer from whom she bought the piece was from Nigeria. 
So far, nothing more is known about this transaction. There is still a need for research, for example, on who the dealer was, and of course, most importantly, where he got the old piece from. Investigating the provenance of Benin holdings in Swiss museums thus also means shedding light on the African agency in the production for the Western market and in the global art trade of objects from Benin. But what does this mean for the way museums deal with colonial collections from Africa? This brings me back to the Swiss Benin initiative and its objectives. As the case studies of the object biographies have shown, global and cooperative provenance research is very important. The Benin holdings and Swiss museums are linked by shared provenances because objects partly came from the same dealers and collectors. The new research project creates synergies in order to uncover these national connections, but also Switzerland's global network and the international art trade. But relying only on provenance information provided by our museum archives confronts the researcher with highly biased, Eurocentric and incomplete information. Therefore, collaboration with Nigerian historians and museum professionals is of great importance for the purpose of taking into account the African perspective on the colonial past and Switzerland and Nigeria's entangled hits history. Thus, new sources and perspectives and narratives such as Nigerian archives, knowledge about the historicity of local markets and oral history come into play when trying to reconstruct object biographies. Secondly, the research results on the provenances of the Benin objects will be communicated openly and transparently. To this end, multilingual information on the objects will be made public on the museum's website or are already. Um, keywords are digitalization, open access. In addition, the colonial acquisition history of the collections will be made public in special and permanent exhibitions in Switzerland. I have already mentioned some examples from recent years, like the ex uh, exhibition Memory in Basel and the question of provenance at our museum, and further thematic exhibitions are planned, for example, next year, the exhibition Wege der Kunst at our museum. Cooperation with artists and cult cultural workers from Nigeria, but also from the Nigerian diaspora is seen as particularly enriching. A good example is the project Iyak Bons Miro, which will be presented tomorrow. The most important point, however, is the dialogue and exchange with Nigeria about the future of these colonial collections. So far, there have been no restitution demands from Nigeria to Switzerland. The discussion in our group have shown that all the museums involved are open to such negotiations. Drawing up general guidelines for dealing with colonial collection in accordance with the Washington principle on Nazi confiscated art could also be another opportunity. On the Nigerian side too, legal regulations for such, uh, such restitutions issues are currently being drafted. According to the Legacy Restoration Trust, which is re responsible for the financing of the new museum in Benin City, it is not just a matter of returning everything to Nigeria. This is also borne out by the long negotiation processes in the Benin Dialogue Group, where rep representatives of European museums work together with members of the royal family, the governor of Edo State, and experts from the national museums. The central topic is restitution, but the discussions are also about loans, the question of ownership, financial support, and cooperation at the academic and museum level. An important project is the new Edo Museum of West African Art. The Ghanaian British star architect David Ajaye has drawn up the plans. At the site where the museum is to be built, archaeological excavations are currently underway in a joint project between the British Museum and Nigerian scholars. Together with artifacts from the museums of the Global North, the remains of the destroyed palace complex are to be presented in the new museum building. Swiss museums are open and ready for returns if that is what Nigeria, Nigeria wants. 
However, we are also prepared to participate in this museum project in whatever way we can and to contribute our many years of experience from other cooperation projects with museums worldwide. I see the negotiation about the colonial history of collections as a chance to establish new relations with Nigeria and to realize joint research and museum projects about the entangled history of Nigeria and Switzerland. However, I think these questions not only concern museums with Benin holdings and their institutional framework at the cantonal or municipal level. Rather, in my open view, it is also a matter of a political and ethical debate for society as a whole. The case study of Benin could be a starting point for further discussions about the Switzerland's entanglement in the colonial area and its effects to this day. And it could also be um, an opportunity to advance the processes of decolonization at various levels in politics, in the field of business, at our museums, but also in other cultural or academic institutions. Thank you very much.